It is time. Sharks in order. Our shark. There's a shark NATO coming. <laughs> George A. Romano, the zombie master himself, brought us a lot of great films over the years, and I thought we would do this little bonus segment here and discuss, you know, three movies in particular, I think, uh, if you haven't seen them, I suggest you do see them, if, especially if you're a zombie fanatic such as the Real Sharks podcast. Um, I want to talk about Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and I want to talk about Day of the Dead. Those are the three movies in the series that came out together in correlation with the story or what story Georgia Romano had for zombies. Because recently, uh, you know, we've discussed Dawn of the Dead, how good we thought Dawn of the Dead was um, originally on another uh, episode. Uh, we discussed how great Dawn of the Dead was, so we won't get too into detail on Dawn of the Dead. But Night of the Living Dead, 1968, uh, this is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, many people will to tell you like when you come over to Rob's house he's usually got that somewhere in the background uh, yeah, I love Night of the Living Dead the black and white one is great I actually personally like the 1990 remake as well but that's going to be for another uh, episode um, but let's uh, let's just talk about the Night of the Living Dead real quick you know start uh, you know Russell St uh, Striner as Johnny Johnny <laughs> and then it had Dewan Jones as Ben Judith O'Day as Barbara uh, Carl Hardman as Harry um, Marilyn Eastman as Helen, and uh, you had Kira Scon as Karen Cooper, Judy Riddler as Judy, Bill Hensman as Zombie One, and that's all I'm gonna read off of the cast right there because I just thought it was I just thought that was funny to end it with that one. The whole beginning of Night of the Living Dead starts out with Johnny and Barbara out to visit their father's grave, and they come across a corpse just wandering in the cemetery, and uh, bada bing, bada boom, we got a zombie movie going. You know, um, <clears throat> Johnny breaks his neck in a horrific way, spoilers, and then, uh, it's a big chase scene, all the way to the chase to the house, where she meets the, uh, the other main character, Ben, and they basically hold up the house, where they find a family that's being held there as well, and basically just trying to stave off the zombie apocalypse in one night at this house. It's a great film, and for a black and white film, it still holds terror, I feel. Uh, there's still some good jump scares in there. You know, it was a movie, too, that actually pushed the boundary. You had nudity in it. You had, you know, you could tell they're eating barbecue, but they got people eating flesh in this movie, of course. Uh, it scared a lot of people. Some people said it's too a metaphor for uh, communism, I've heard, or for consumerism, but we're not even going to get into that because I think it's silly to even talk about zombies in that sense. It's just a zombie film, ladies and gentlemen. It is. It's just fun, so we're having fun here. So, I don't know. I really, really like Lion of the Living Dead. You know, the ratings on this movie, I mean, if you oh, can they're see, fantastic. they're across the board, you know, four out of five. You know, 8 out of 10, everywhere, across the board. Um, amazing movie. So, I highly recommend it. I give Night of the Living Dead a 9 out of 10, personally. You give it a 9? I, I give it a 9.5 out of 10. It is a great uh, film. I mean, I remember the first time I watched it, I was... I actually watched it over at your yep. house. I showed you this film, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first time I watched this, I was in amazement to see what Romero was able to do during that time, because... There weren't a lot of zombie movies right no, there. He there wasn't. created. He kind of created that whole yeah, genre, the whole universe. The genre and how they acted and what they did. And you know, the one scene that I love the most, even though it's supposed to be gory and scary, is them eating um, the people and showing them ripping it off. Yeah. And, and yes, it's bar or cooked food, but it gives you the presence. Oh my God, they're actually eating, eating some. Yeah, they're eating people. And you know, the the family that's held in the basement. They're trying to survive, saying, oh yeah, we're not going to let you in here. Yeah. The whole even, tension between the characters in the house. Yeah. Oh my god, the, the tension between them all, and like, and even though, spoiler alerts, the daughter was bitten, she turned into this zombie, and I think she bit her mom as well. Yeah, she, she actually kills them with a, uh, with a, uh, a tr uh, one of those shovels, the shovels, the uh, gardening shovels originally. A uh, spade, I think. Mm -hmm, yeah, a spade. She yeah. kills them with a spade originally. And you know, this movie came out on October 1st, 1968, with a budget of only $114,000. That's pretty incredible. It is. You know, I actually just found the box office numbers. $30 million. Wow. It made back $30 million. That's pretty good. That is. That's I mean, really good. That's a, that's a very successful film. 
which, you know, then he was allowed to do Dawn of the Dead, and as I said, we've spoken about Dawn of the Dead, so if you want to hear our whole breakdown of Dawn of the Dead, please listen to our Dawn of the Dead, uh, 74 versus, uh, 05, Dawn of the Dead, or 04, whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, listen to that episode, but Dawn of the Dead 2 is an awesome film, you know, um, for what it is, it was, you know, came in color, so the zombies were a little bit, uh, yeah, you know, they leave a little bit of desire on the facts wise, but but given at the time, it's still a good film. I've recently heard people tell me that this Dawn of the Dead is dull. What? Yeah, you know what? I guess you can make that argument if you're talking about it in today's movie era. When you're talking about these fast paced kind of films you have where you don't really care too much about character development or, you know, trying to provide the fact, especially in zombie films, that characters do not have plot armor in most zombie films, everybody is pretty much a uh walking happy mail to the dead and that's why I think Dawn of the Dead is really good especially you know we've already held this poll for you our audience and we know that you you know those of you listening to us you guys prefer the 78 one over mm-hmm. the other one even though I still like I still like the remake I put the remake as one of the greatest remakes of all time it like paved the way for Zack Snyder it made Zack Snyder it made people take notice of Zack Snyder but the original Dawn of the Dead for those who don't know him never heard it, it's basically the sequel to Night of the Living Dead, in which a uh, group of, uh, basically a group of TV anchors, and yeah, it's a TV anchor and her boyfriend, who's also, I guess, the helicopter pilot, yep. two soldiers, basically part of a, uh, I guess, a SWAT team, and they're basically all trying to escape on a helicopter, and they come across uh, one of those big indoor malls, and they decide to hold it up in the mall. And it's, a, it's actually a really good film, it's a bunker down kind of film, of where, you know, we gotta basically kind of cozy up here and w- wait to see what happens to the characters, see what they do and, you know, what, you know, what they do in this apoc- post-apocalyptic uh, scenery and, you know, what would you do at this time, too? Which is an interesting uh, take on it. It's like, you know, that's what I get when I watch that movie. I'm like, man, if I was in the mall, what would I do exactly? But this is one of those films you had one of the greatest speeches, you know. Granddad was a priest in Trinidad. He used to tell us when there's no more room in hell, the dead walk here. No, you know, I mean, like Rob just said, I mean, you got to go listen to that other show because we go so much into detail about that list of films. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the remake. I mean, that is a fantastic remake. But with this one, I don't know. I mean, just the how it came from that time, the makeup style that they did. I mean, they did... They painted these people and they put on uh, makeup powder to make them kind of look corpsey. like the dick. Yeah, corpsey. And for that time, I mean, you never saw anybody do too much into that. So it was. They uh, also used the local population yeah, around the area. So a lot of people that are in that film are actually just extras. Just, yep, yep. For zombies, yeah. You know, one of my favorite scenes is when they are fortify the 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 mall because I mean. You get so many weak points. I mean, what else could you do? You gotta move trucks and. It's very and, detailed, yeah. Yeah, and they go into detail a lot. And that's why I love this movie so much. It's kind of like a survival guide. Also, kind of a time capsule into what malls were like in the. You know, these are early malls in like the 1978s oh. there, so it's kind of funny because, you know, late 80s there, and when malls actually had gun stores in them, and they actually had all these other crazy things that were in malls. Malls were more like a mini city than it was uh, just a shopping center. So that was how these people were able to even survive there too. But one of the ones I really want to talk about over the years, which I think uh, it's grown on me. It actually has. And that is uh, Day of the Dead. That's right. The Day of the Dead, the 1985 one. You know, it made $34 million at the box office. Pretty good for a zombie film. Uh, it actually has a 7 out of 10 on IMDb, 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, 60% uh, Metacritic. I did not like this film for the longest time, mostly because I don't like Land of the Dead, which I still don't like. Which is, for those of you who don't know, the movie that came after this one. And the reason I don't like Land of the Dead, let me just start off with this premise, is because in Land of the Dead, they kind of talk about this idea that the zombies evolve, that they're able to evolve into these... Diff- you know, they're able to get smarter and stuff like that, but it's like, they're they're dead, George. They're, they're, they're dead. I did not like that aspect at all. You know, we can talk about John Leguizamo and all the other characters in there, but that's a whole other subject. But I just didn't think Land of the Dead was very strong. Nor do I think Diary of the Dead is, and I think every real zombie uh, fan out there knows those two movies aren't that great. But, back to Day of the Dead. 
For a long time, I used to give Day of the Dead, like, a really bad credit, because I just thought the whole premise of, uh, them training the zombies in there was so stupid. Until recently, when I actually sat down, buckled up, and was like, you know what? I'm gonna dive really headfirst into this one. And I gotta say, my mind has changed. I think the film is actually a good premise of the idea because it, it, it works two ways too which is good and like I almost wanted to do a, another special about how the villain is actually right in Day of the Dead because he even though he's like the most horrible over the top uh, one of the most over the top actors I've ever seen you know yeah no offense to Joseph uh, Palladio but he's just it was just really over the top uh, uh, yeah Terry Alexander and there's John Laurie uh, Cardell was the main uh, actress in it you had Sherman Howard uh, Greg Nectaro, Jonathan Conroy as McDermott, Gary Howard as Steele. So, in the premise of the uh, Day of the Dead initially is it's a bunch of military soldiers in an underground base protecting these scientists who are trying to figure out a way. Uh, you don't really know. It's kind. Of, they don't really point out too specifically whether it's a cure or just kind of a means to deal with the zombies. But they're all kind of stuck together. There's not that many of them left, and they're all kind of going stir crazy on each other. But the doctor in the film, who they refer to as Dr. Frankenstein, is actually trying to domesticate zombies in this. And by that, he's basically having the soldiers bring him specimens in which he, one of them in particular, he calls Bub. Funny enough, basically, and what he's doing is he's trying to make him remember. He gives him a phone. He gives him a book. He gives him all these things that one would remember when they were alive. And he knows that the zombie has a reaction to them, which is interesting. At first, I was like, well, okay, wow, that's dumb. But then when he really talks about, like, this idea of how they're able to be manipulated, you know, but they have to be rewarded. And then that's when it falls short. Because then that's where I go, the, the bad guy actually has, the, the main, the, the, the general actually has the whole, he's actually not in the wrong. Because, you know, he's actually training and trying to get these zombies domesticated, yet he's rewarding them by feeding them the bodies of the soldiers. <laughs> and that makes him pissed. And rightfully so, rightfully so, these guys are sacrificing themselves to get them the specimens, and they're just feeding them his dying soldiers. So that's when I was like, wow, the military guy's not in the wrong here. But I see both sides of it, which makes this film really interesting, because the professor is right in the sense of, you don't have enough bullets to kill all the dead, where he even says, we're the, like, the minority, we're like 40,000 to 1 here. So, they don't even... They don't even have enough bullets to kill them all. So they have to do something else to basically stem the tide of the zombie apocalypse here. And then you got the the, 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 the colonel, who's actually the right. He's actually the captain, but he's basically the head. He's in charge. So, uh, But he's even saying, you know, why should we even bother? They're dead. Why shouldn't we just kill them? They're dead. And then, you know, of course he sees his men being fed to these things. And it's like, yeah, I'd be angry too. So I see both sides of it. And I feel like, but this is where I kind of think the uh, movie kind of falls flat, as I think Sarah's character almost kind of feels like she's just there. Like, I, like I, I'm not, like, taking away from her acting ability or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, her character in itself feels like she's just there. Like, just to witness this whole thing. Because she doesn't really, she has a premise in the film, you know, she's kind of the catalyst and the, uh, the softness to the doctor and the captain because if, without her there initially they'd both be blowing each other away initially but she also lends tension to it too in which you know she doesn't sit down and leads to that whole like Mexican standoff between everybody in the film but overall though I think Day of the Dead is actually a lot better than I thought and let me just say the ending of it is very interesting because you had the captain who basically dismissed Dr. Frankenstein's work and when the zombie he is holding captive gets out, he is actually upset and does not eat the doctor. There's even that point in the movie, which is the whole premise that I thought was, wow, like, that's interesting. He puts a uh, headset on the zombie, the zombie reacts, and then basically there's a point where the zombie grabs the professor's arm, but he doesn't eat him. So they actually do remember things. And in the end, he shows him how to use a gun, in which the zombie basically kills the main, the last bad guy with the gun. For all his zombie brethren to feast on. <laughs> and that is Day of the Dead, basically, in a nutshell. Well, some of you may be going, wow, zombies remembering things? They're dead. I know, it seemed so stupid to me initially, too, when I first watched it. But when you dive into the professor's kind of work and really look at the detail of what he's talking about, 
it makes sense, especially if you're talking about this universe of the zombie apocalypse, in which I guess they still have memories, which, you know, they even point that out into Dawn of the Dead. He even says, dude, maybe they're here for us. Maybe this is the place that made them happiest, you know? So I guess you, in context to the universe in which it exists, I think Day of the Dead is actually a good movie. It's actually, I think it's the weakest of the three, but, you know, how could you follow Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, as we've said with Alien 3? That's just my take on it, but I think Day of the Dead is actually, uh, it's, it's a lot better than I remembered it. I think uh, a lot of good special effects, too. Actors, though, the acting in it is atrocious. I'll, I'll, I will not give that film any credence to acting ability. I mean, the act, acting is horrific. But, even the props, too, are something to be desired. But, overall, I think the idea of the film is really good. And I would give Day of the Dead, you know, I give Day of the Dead a 7.8. Wow, that's really being generous. As a zombie film. As a zombie film. As a zombie film. You know, I mean, I... One of the original three you need to see. I mean, I, I would agree to this being the third, or one of the three that you need to see, but I mean, this movie takes so long to build up, and that's what kind of, I think, makes a lot of people That is a great interest. point. That's a great point. And, you know, I, I remember seeing But, so point. does Dawn of the Dead. Technically, like I said, people have told me the movie's dull, but, you know, is it that this movie takes so long to build up, or is that just George A. Romero's 1985-70 style? That's a question. question. Yeah, exactly. that's a good question. But, you know, the differences between the two is because even though Dawn of the Dead takes a while to build up, you start to see the, you get to see more of the character development. But with this one, it kind of lacks that. And then it's, like, oh yeah, have you been? Or, oh yeah, I'm going to go do this now. You don't see that much of a character development, and I think that's a part of it where it lost, it got lost to me, especially in the beginning. You know, them like lowering everything down. You see him going into the bunker. I mean, you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. You have to kind of listen to what they're talking about. And you know, I hate to say this, and you know, to, you know, I want you to continue your point, but the point I want to make too on some aspects is audiences sometimes. It's gonna. And I'm not mean, mean my listeners, but sometimes you need to be told directly what's going on in order for to get the film because the problem some movies make nowadays is they want the audience to to do research and we don't want to do that no. <laughs> and i think this is one of those times where maybe george uh Aramon thought people would do a little bit more research into it but it was like no we just want to we just want to know what's going yeah, on Yeah, we just want to watch the movie we want to be entertained yeah you know that's a great point too i mean i mean because i always want to how did they find this place were they already there did like people start coming and say, "Oh yeah, there's a military base. Let's see what happens." We stand on this platform. Oh, we're going into a bunker. Um, the one thing I didn't like is them keeping hold of that that zombie. I mean, cute. You don't like that aspect of I the didn't like that aspect. trying to make see if domesticate the zombies. Yeah. See, I, I didn't at first. I was exactly where you were, but when I buckled into it a little more, I was like, "When you got really nothing left here in this universe, I mean, what what else could they do? Really? I mean, I don't know because then it." it I thought about movies like Vito and stuff, and I was like, this is kind of the next logical step. I mean, granted, Vito's a parody. For those who don't know, it's Leave it to Beaver, Leave it to Beaver meets Zombie film. But, I don't know, I just thought this was kind of a more of a logical step for George Romero's uh, work to go, but not, it didn't go to the Land of the Dead aspect, which is where I think it got ruined, where it killed it. You know, it wasn't, because at first it was just like, oh, they remember, but they're dead. And then Land of the Dead was like, oh, they're evolving. And I was like, come on, they're dead. See, that's where it lost me. But I guess I, I see the argument you're making. It is dull. And the premise of it, I was right where you were. It was like, I don't like the whole holding the zombie ha captive and trying to teach it things. I think that's kind of dumb. It's like, yes, but if you dive into that element of the characters and there's nothing really left, and you can even make the argument, too, that they all have lost their minds at this point. The Frankenstein, the Doctor, including the Captain, so... Doctor doesn't. Even, I always took it as that too. Like he's lost his mind. <laughs> like he doesn't even know what to do. Well, you know, I, I liked the Doctor I and mean, what he was. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. Like what he was trying to do was incredibly bad, but he was trying to come from a good spot, and that's why I liked him in the movie. That the the Captain, I 
I actually thought he would have was gonna die a lot sooner. I'm like, oh, please, somebody kill him off. He's he's a he's an annoying character. He's he too, well, he's more over the top. He's so over the top. I mean, everything was so extreme. <laughs> like when he she gets up, he's like, sit down, I'm gonna blow you away. And it's like, jeez, okay. Like his character was very, very, very extreme. Which is, uh, I, but I don't know. In the sense, too, I understand that aspect of being that extreme when everyone's kind of lost their mind at the end of the world here. So I think Day of the Dead, though, is a, uh, I think it's a classic now. I, uh, like I said, I take back a lot of the criticism I originally gave it, and I actually think it's one of the original trio you need to see. And there's the music for our first break. Don't you go anywhere, all my real sharks. We will be right back. Hi, my name is George, a.k.a. Spike Green. You may remember me for shouting out Real Sharks podcasts over at the Film Geek Collective. Basically, anyone who supports our, us at all gets to be part of the collective. No money required. If you want to learn more about film, if you want to learn just a whole bunch of tricks and tips and stuff, and just various things about film, I am like a go-to guide. I hope to be a go-to guide. Now... If you want to check out the film Geek Collective, the link is anchor.fm slash george-d2. Alright, well, I guess I'll see you guys there, and thank you Real Sharks Podcast, keep listening to them too. Thank you so, so, so much. You're always welcome at the film Geek Collective, and don't you forget it. Do you or someone you know struggle through life with anxiety-related mental disorders? Ever get that feeling that you are one of the few? I'm here to tell you that you are not alone. Take a journey with me as I talk about key points in my past and how they may have led to me being diagnosed with anxiety and panic disorder. After which, we will talk about different ways to tone down the anxiety and maybe even beat it together on anxiety. The easiest way to remember the name is by thinking about how one searches for a state of zen in the midst of the anxieties of life. My name is Gerald, and I'm the host of Anxiety. Hello, potential listeners. My name is The Vern, and I'm the host of the Cinema Recall Podcast. On most shows, myself, along with some great guests, we will talk about a movie and then some of the most iconic moments that happened in said movie. On top of that, you'll get bonus shows where I will give you short reviews about new and classic movies, or I'll just rant and rave about something going on in the entertainment industry. So come check us out. We're available on Anchor, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, most other places. Don't forget to follow us on social media. On Twitter, we are at Cinema underscore Recall. And then on Facebook, Instagram, we are Cinema Recall Podcast. Uh, don't forget to email us your ad spots to play on future episodes. That email is cinemarecall at gmail.com. Hope to see you around, and thank you very much for listening. So I'm laying in bed. And I'm having this weird dream. I mean, a really weird dream. Next thing you know, I'm on board a freaking ship, guys. What? Right? And these aliens here, they're giving me the face hug treatment. Whoa. Giving me the chest bursting treatment, you know? No way. Just give me the basic Travis Walton experience. Man. And you know what they told me? What's what? that? We're a big fan of the Real Sharks podcast. Digging this tune. This is what the zombies twerk to. And Squid, I believe you wanted to get back to a uh, conversation we were having. And you know, I wanted to touch back on one thing you said. We were talking about uh, how they were able to remember something and how you brought up Fido. Another movie that kind of has that aspect too is Shot of the Dead. Yeah. At the end, where all the zombies. He remembers them, yeah. Yeah, and they, they got that memory. And, you know, oh, yeah, we were able to do like certain kinds of things, but they got them all chained up. 
just like in Fido. So that see, that's what I'm saying. It's like even though at first I thought it, that's really stupid, I look back at some of the other films that have come out since, and I'm like, I guess that was the next logical step to go in that idea. Is that yeah, I guess if you can't, you know. Beat him, domesticate him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of the premise of Vito. I mean, Vito is—that's exactly the premise of Vito. If you can't beat him, domesticate him. And it was also because uh, if you've never seen Vito, you should. We've spoken about this movie, I think, a few times. But Vito's amazing movie. Um, you know, I guess we'll get into it real quick. You know, it's Leave It to Beaver meets zombie films, but it, it's so much more because it's about how humans can't really let go yeah. of the dead too, and that's kind of the premise of it too. Is like they create, they domesticated zombies to basically do subservient things, but people even, like, have zombie girlfriends, they have zombie butlers, you know, they, they make their uh, grandfathers and everything still part of the family. Vito was a 2006 film, and it has a great, great all-star cast. You had uh, Carrie Ann Moss, uh, who, who's Helen Robinson, that's Trinity, for those people who don't know. Yep. You had uh, Bill Conaghy as Vito. Wow. Yeah, I know, right? You had Kay Sun Ray as Timmy Robinson. Henry Cerzerni as Mr. Bottoms, Dylan Baker as Bill Robinson, Tim Blake Nielsen as Mr. Tilapas, Alexa Fast as Sidney Bottoms. Uh, like I said, you had a lot of good, good actors in this film, and it's such a good, quirky comedy. Uh, and you know, it, like I said, I can't express this enough. It's Leave It to Beaver with a touch of Lassie meets zombie film. It's funny. It's clever. And I know some people out there are going, oh, that, that sounds really stupid. But no, it's actually, it works really, really well in this movie. Um, there's so much lore that's already attached to the film. I mean, the beginning of the film opens up with the, like we were saying to you earlier, you got to tell the audience directly what happened. And they tell you, they do this whole kind of uh, why we fight little episode of it came from space. And it talks about how World War Z happened instead of World War II where humans ba basically battled zombies instead of, you know, Nazis. And so the world exists basically in these um, isolated community factions, I guess, in which it's all run by Zomcom, which is a company that basically made the zombie collars, which domesticate zombies. But uh, we pretty much told you the whole premise of Vito, and we suggest you really see it, because it is a glorious, underrated film. One of the best films I think I've ever uh, I've ever had the privilege of watching as a comedy, I guess you could say. It is funny. I really do enjoy that film. You know, I always consider this as a, a comedy with zombies in it, because, I mean, there, there's so much comedy in it, you, you don't really notice the zombies until, like, and they start bringing them in, and, you know, I, I love the name of the comp, uh, the company, Zomcom, Zomcom yeah. Corp, I mean, who would have thought it, I mean, huh, they, they got zombies actually making the collars, too. What's funny, too, yeah, yeah, and that's what's funny, like, even, like, when I say the Lassie part, there's parts of where the zombie comes up to Timmy. He's just like, what is it, boy? Ooh. Yeah, and he's just like, what? What's that? Ooh. <laughs> and it's, one of the, it's literally like a dog. <laughs> and, it, and what's funny is the zombie, spoilers, ends up caring for the kid. The zombie does actually care. But it's so much more than just a story about domesticating zombies. It's a story about, basically, you can't let go. Because there's, there's a lot of references to things like... Vito, the zombie itself, who's the main, uh, main, you know, the star of it, the main creature, uh, the boy points out that he had a heart attack. He didn't die of, like, you know, eat anything else. And he goes, oh, just like Grandpa, which is hilarious. Oh, my God, remember that commercial? Grandpa's <laughs> fall down and <laughs> fell down. He's getting back up. It's like the Zomcom chip. When the elderly, when they hit the floor, <laughs> or you know, we take action. That's right. And oh, they put, man. like, like el the elderly in prisons and stuff. God. It's such a, uh inverted, you, crazy, dystopian zombie film. I suggest everyone, uh, I recommend everyone see that film. Vito, though. I'm going to comfortably give that movie an 8 on this show because I think it's so underrated and so funny. You know, I, I'm there with you, an 8. Yeah, it's it's an 8. It's a, I, I would consider this a must-see kind of comedy. You know, but look, while we're on the subject of zombies, let's just talk about some of these other zombie films that have recently come out that I would actually kind of recommend people to see. One of them in particular, I'm not going to go too much into detail of it because it's so gross, uh, Contracted. first one came out in 2013, the second one came out in 2015, so it merited a sequel. And i got to say, this is one of those times where I think a sequel is better than the first one. But I'm not going to get too, too much into this film. I'm going to give you the uh, cast of it, the main star, because she did a great job for what it was, which was uh, Nahara Townsend. She played Samantha, and then you had Caroline Williams, Sam's mom, Allison McDonald was Alice. 
Matt Mercer was Riley. But Contracted is about a girl basically succumbing to the zombie uh, virus and turning into a corpse with some disgusting, gory scenes. I mean, I don't even want to get into detail of it because it's so gross. I mean, the, the film I can only think on par with, which even disturbs this host, and I've seen them all, but a movie I have a personal problem watching is uh, Human Centipede 2 with things. Oh. God, and see, that movie, I would compare to that movie because it's like, oh my God, it's one of these films where you're just watching a person rot away into a corpse. The second one I actually think is a little better because it's uh, it actually takes place in a hospital yeah. in which you see the progression of the virus happening and zombies are starting to enter the, the hospital. And it's about mainly the guy who created the whole apocalypse, you know. Uh, spoilers, he's a guy going around basically banging women and spreading this disease everywhere. So that's, uh, that's a basically contracted in a nutshell, and I really enjoy this film. Another one I would recommend to people is Brain Dead, or as some people know it in the States, uh, Dead Alive. This is Peter Jackson's uh, masterpiece. That's right, Peter Jackson did this. Mr. King Kong, Lord of the Rings himself did this film. <laughs> it is one of the most glorious films you will ever see. Spoilers, it is about the, a rat bringing the, basically the zombie plague over to England, and uh, his mom gets bit, and his mom becomes a corpse, but it's a comedy, it's meant to be a comedy, but the most glorious scene you will ever see, spoilers, 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 he runs around in this mansion with a lawnmower turned up, basically mowing down corpses left and right, I mean, I'm talking buckets and buckets of blood, I think this movie probably has, has a record for most blood on set, because oh, he's slipping and sliding in the blood. I mean, it is that, that bad. So, you know, I, I, I love this film. If you, if you like Peter Jackson movies, you're going to be tripped out by this one because it's, it's a great film. And, you know, of course, you got the other movies that everyone knows about, such as uh, Shaun of the Dead. Black Summer was another good show on Netflix I enjoyed quite a bit. I definitely recommend that over uh, the cliche Walking Dead. I really am going to get some flack for this, I feel like. Maybe from you, maybe from the rest of the panel, but I think Walking Dead destroy is destroying the zombie genre. I really, really feel like it is. When it first started, I loved Walking Dead. I loved Walking Dead up and past, I think, season five. But then it became this story about everything else going on, and the zombies are just in the background. Zombies, it's like, it's not even a zombie apocalypse anymore. It's more like, uh, you know, just factions. It's more, which I guess you can make the argument that's more realistic this idea of that eventually zombies would just become nothing and then it would be what takes place after the fact. But still, the show is just, it drags on so much with some of the characters and it, it's almost worse than Game of Thrones in making you love some of these characters and then killing them off for no particular reason. Some of them die, you know, so unnecessarily for no reason. Like grisly deaths. Yeah, grisly deaths. And, you know, I, while I'm uh, I'm not like a PC, you know, oh, I need my characters to be foo -foo happy forever. It's like, oh my god, some of this just, it's like, ugh, ugh. Ugh, how much are you going to hit me before I have to, you know, kind of not care about the story anymore? I stopped caring about, like, I didn't even care about the story when when Glenn died. I stopped caring about that. Like, you know, everyone was so upset when he died in the, the series, and I was like, eh, I'm kind of over it. Then, you know, spoilers, Carl, too. I was like, eh, kind of don't care. I just, there was so much in, like, I think Walking Dead for... What it is has good moments. Don't get me wrong. It has some great stuff in it. Like, it has some good, good stuff. Like, I, one of my favorite scenes is when, you know, you had this kid that never came out of the house, and they're trying to walk him through the uh, the neighborhood dressed as a corpse, and he just freaks out, and the zombies eat him, and they have to yeah. be quiet, and, like, you know, that's brutal. <laughs> the governor episode, one of the best episodes on TV. I mean, his whole arc, character arc, his whole, like, like, little series they had of his was amazing. I loved him. I thought he was a great actor. I think the governor story is the best plot of the walking dead um everything else in it though i mean yeah you can make some there's some great scenes and some great like things of where you go wow i'd have i could only do that in that situation i just think walking dead has just stretched it out so far stretched it out too much to the point of where it's like i don't even see it as a zombie series anymore you know i mean i, I love this show i've and you know I mean, a lot of people are going to be surprised by this but I've stopped watching the show. I mean, I couldn't take any yeah. more of it. I mean, I never got to. I never watched the episode where Carl dies. Um, yeah, neither did I. I just know it happened. Yeah, I know it happens. Um, uh, I don't even know what season I ended on. I mean, I, I think I'm on like nine or something. I think it was like when they were looking for. Uh, I saw when they were looking for that one guy, uh, Keegan. 
Yeah, Tegan or, or Ke- Negan. Negan, yeah, Negan. When they were looking for Negan, then they were like, I'm Negan. I'm, I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Right. I was like, I am <laughs> done with this show officially. And then there was the big shock of, you know, Glenn dying and stuff. And I was like, I'm done with this. I, I saw that episode. I, I think that was like the last season I watched of the show, and I was just done with it. And we get, we, we've talked about this before. It is terrible, terrible bad writing when you have a character, you save a character, just to kill him five minutes later. What are you, Star Wars? What are you like, oh, oh, Chewbacca got caught. Oh, no, he got blown up. Oh, wait, Chewbacca wasn't on that ship. <gasps> <laughs> it's like, that's terrible. That's a bad writing. Bad, 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 bad writing. I know, I'm gonna, I, I never thought this show would go on for as long no, as it neither did. No, neither did I. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if they're running out of source material, but it kind of seems Apparently like not, they are. Apparently not, because they did Surviving the Dead, which I thought was just as bad. Like, it was good for the first, like, two episodes, and then it got really, really boring. I, I haven't seen on the, like, the prequel to it. Um, didn't really catch my interest at all. I know that they have uh, one character that is tied into that one. Um, it was um, it was Rick's uh, friend when he met in the first episode. The, yeah. the father. Yeah, I know I what you're talking about. Yeah, that. and that yeah, but you know who cares because that came way after the fact. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly the episode you're talking about where he can't kill his wife and he's sniping her out yeah. the window. Yeah, it's the first episode, and then you never hear anything about that guy until way later. And at that point, I didn't care anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I did, at that point, who cared? I didn't care. <laughs> but that's Walking Dead for me. Uh, you know, but there are some other good ones. You know, we've talked about 28 Weeks and 28 Days, how we thought those were good. Um, I definitely recommend those two films. I mean, some of the other ones I think are really good, too, that never get really any recommendations, such as Dead Snow. I think oh, Dead Snow is... Yeah, I think Dead Snow. The first one is great. Yeah, the first one is um, amazing. Another movie that does it really well, which I uh, I enjoyed, but I didn't enjoy it, was World War Z. I enjoyed it because I read the book and I thought the book was good, but what I didn't enjoy about it was uh, all the plot armor Brad Pitt has as a character. I mean, my God, he might as well be invincible in that movie. He survives a plane crash. Everyone else in the entire plane dies except him. And I'm like, wow. Well, and and the... uh, Oh, the soldier? Yeah, yeah, the soldier. But still, it was like, really? Wow, God, I just... You know, I I love World War Z. I mean, that that movie still holds up today, and especially in our current uh, nature right now, that movie just holds up so well. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I agree. But that's been uh, this episode, this little special here of our favorite zombie films. I am your host, Rob, with the squid. We'll see you guys later. And you stay healthy. Thank you.